We're waiting. Ready? We're going live. Hello, welcome to tonight's event for the Diversity, Diverse Perspectives in Digital Media and Design 2021 Speaker Series. To paraphrase James Baldwin, nothing can be changed until it is faced. This is certainly true of the inequities that have historically shaped digital media content, fields, and careers. Join UConn Digital Media Design Department in welcoming tonight's special guests as we try to reflect on our own practice and support greater equity, diversity, and inclusion. This event tonight is brought to you today by our department in partnership with UConn's Native American Cultural Programs, the Human Rights Institute, and Human Rights Dodd Impact. We would like to begin today's event by acknowledging that the land on which we typically gather on here in Storrs, Connecticut, is the territory of the Mohegan, Manchatucket Pequot, Eastern Pequot, Scaticoke, Golden Hill Paguset, Nipmunk, and Lenape peoples, who have stewarded this land throughout the generations. We thank them for their strength and resilience in protecting this land and aspire to uphold our responsibilities according to their example. Please take a moment to recognize the land that you are on and those who have stewarded the land since time immemorial. Today's event will feature an hour of conversation with our guest artists, including questions from the virtual audience. Please take advantage of the YouTube chat box to submit questions for our guests, which we will try to answer to during this discussion. I'm Heather Elliott Samalaro, and I'm a digital artist and filmmaker and the department head for digital media and design at the University of Connecticut. DMD is a young department founded in 2013, which has rapidly grown to 350 undergraduate and graduate students, 25 full-time faculty, and seven undergraduate concentrations across the full digital media spectrum from film production, animation, interactivity, game design, business, and humanities, at both the stores and Stanford campuses. And in our department, we value and celebrate our students' diverse backgrounds, and we support their development both as individuals and as professional media creators. And this Diverse Perspectives in Digital Media and Design Speaker Series is one celebration of those shared values. I'm happy to introduce today's student co-host, Sydney Fournier. She is a first year digital media and design student studying 3D animation. She is currently working on a student film as a lighting director and hopes to get involved with more films in the future. She is eager to learn more about animation for the DMD program and work for a large animation studio after graduation. And she has enjoyed watching the Diverse Perspective series so far and is really excited to be co-hosting today's event. Welcome, Sydney. Thank you, I'm so happy to be here. And now it is my extreme pleasure to welcome today's three panelists who will share their insights and experience in today's event complex narratives and indigenous solidarity. Tracy Rector is a filmmaker, curator, community organizer, and programmer. Currently, currently she is serving as the managing director of storytelling at Neotero, a nonprofit committed to supporting indigenous governance and guardianship. She has directed and produced over 400 films and is in production on her sixth feature documentary, Out of the Muck, with support from ITVS. As an impact producer, Tracy served on the team for the Emmy Award-winning feature documentary, Dawnland. Her work has been fe featured in National Geographic, Imagine Native Film and Media Arts Festival, Cannes, Toronto International Film Festival, and the Smithsonian Museum of the American Indian. She is the co-founder of Longhorse Media, a nonprofit focused on galvanizing indigenous and local communities through film production. From 2005 to 2021, they work with over 50 tribal nations and help train 3,000 young people. Tracy has received many awards for her work in utilizing media for social justice and is a Firelight Media Fellow, a WGBH Producer Fellow, Sundance Institute Lab Fellow, and Tribeca All Access Grantee. Tracy's first major museum installation opened in June 2018 at the Seattle Art Museum and recently completed her second term as the Seattle Arts Commissioner. She is also the mother of two young adults. Let's take a look at one of Tracy's most recent projects. You are the culmination of all your people. And they exist for you, and you exist for them. 
We are dependent upon not only one another, but everything in our environment. And we leave one to grow next year. For us, land is ancestor. When developers start to open up land, it becomes a bare room. This is where it's going into the community, not this stuff. Let me give you some of this meat and you give me some money. And we don't care if we like you or don't like you, we still won't get it. It's embedded in everything of our culture. It's a way of life, not just one act. We have to tell our truths and our true history. And once we do that, then we get to heal from that. And then we get to create the new. It's time for us to share these things. Hmm. Thank you, Tracy. I'm so excited you're here. What an incredible trailer. Thank you. Talk more about that later. Um, next, we have Raven Two Feathers. Uh, Raven Two Feathers, Cherokee, is Seneca, Cayuga, Comanche, is a two spirit Emmy Award winning creator based in Seattle, Washington. Originally from New Mexico, they spent their childhood moving and exploring indigenous cultures across the continent and the Pacific. They started making films in Hawaii after enrolling in a film elective, putting them on the path they dreamed of since they were three. They made their first explicitly indigenous film during Tracy Rector's Superfly program. They graduated magna cum laude with a BFA in film production from the Santa Fe University of Art and Design, and they have been able to explore new mediums without the Western fear of imperfection hindering them. They recently released a comic-based zine, The Qualifications of Being, about their journey of realizing they are trans and two-spirit. They continue to grow and explore their practice through the people they meet and the stories that guide them. So let's share an excerpt from one of Raven's, Raven's most recent creative projects, and we'll have some questions about this later as well. A long time ago. When we enter, we land in the middle of the concrete mudflats between downtown Seattle and the Salish Sea. A gust of wind carries four glowing sprites, which each land on virtual representations of different flora. Payats. Olal. Tichachoeats. Aub. We start by gifting tobacco to the cedar sapling, and it begins to tell us the story of how it came to be. The story cues instrumentation unique to each plant, which is affected as we move through the narrative. After learning about each plant, we wave an arm to propel their seeds, helping them cover a quadrant of the 360 video of Seattle. Once connected with all four, they form a cocoon around us where we can more intimately interact with them by brushing dust off of them, revealing their names in Lachutzi. While in the pod, we're transported, almost like a TARDIS, through time, into a fully indigenous future. We push out to emerge from the pod to see the plants and Coast Salish and other native peoples thriving in the future as ecological technology whizzes above and around us. Each plant passes teachings to us, informing us how they help the people. The now fully grown cedar beckons us back to Seattle. We appear right back where we started in modern Seattle but when we look at the cedar sapling, the iridescent outline of the fully grown cedar sits protectively around it. As the outline begins to draw itself upwards, we rise with the lines and you're given the ability to draw out the indigenous future city over the modern day and recognize that our futures are much more real than we give them credit for. I love that and I can't wait. We're gonna have some questions about that in very soon, Raven. Uh, and thank you, thank you for being here. And finally, we also have Jin Yoo Kim. Is, she is a Korean Bolivian American filmmaker currently producing a feature docu documentary, Man's and Our Divided, When Water Becomes Dust, directed by Ann Paneko, 
which explores California water issues through the eyes of Native Americans, Japanese American World War II incarcerees, and environmentalists. She co-produced many films and served as the digital engagement impact producer for Waking Dream and was the, the LA theatrical impact producer for Blowing Up. She most recently directed a two minute short spam fight, which is so great, by the way, I love that, uh, about an Asian American woman who cooks spam during COVID's shelter in place, uh, despite her live in vegetarian boyfriend's disgust. She is a 2021 Sundance Creative Producers Fellow, a 2020 Film Independent X CNN Original Series DocuSeries Intensive Fellow, a 2020 Film Independent Doc Lab Fellow, and was a 2017 Firelight Media Impact Producing Fellow. She received her MFA in Film and TV Production from USC and a BA in Psychology and Cinema and Media Studies from Wellesley College. So thank you, Jen, for being here as well. Um, let's take a look at the trailer for Manzanar Diverted. There's stories about things that happen here, but nobody listens. My people, my ancestors, my grandparents have lived on this lake for thousands of years. The outsiders came into this valley and renamed it. We called it Payahunari, which means the place where the water always flows. I was evacuated from Los Angeles on May 9th, 1942. We were sent to the Manzanar concentration camp. The period I spent in Manzanar was the most traumatic experience of my life. Manzanar is one square mile of land that has a deep history of forced removal. Los Angeles bones in the heart of the valley. They came here for the water. They are trying to recharacterize this valley as always being a desert. What made it such a desert is their pumping. This was the lake. This was all water before that. Many people who lived at Manzanar developed upper respiratory breathing problems, like my grandmother. I just don't have any energy when I walk a little ways. I get tired real fast. Not only was water a major factor in the sighting of Manzanar, water was also the means of resistance. This water, our water, it's there for everybody. Natives, non-natives, everybody. Don't take everything. I think we've reached a point in America where we have to look on ourselves as more of a diverse nation. Wow. We're gonna talk about all of these amazing projects that we've seen so far. So let's go ahead and jump in um, with the question. I think it helps to get us started by just a little bit of background. So if we could start with learning a little bit more about each of you. Um, Tracy, you've worn a lot of different hats in your career. Uh, you always have. Can you talk to us a little bit about where you started and how your roles have grown from community organizing into filmmaking and beyond? And uh, let us get to know you. Sure, thank you. Um, first, I would just like to acknowledge that I am calling in from the traditional territories of the Puyallup peoples and what today is called Tacoma, Washington. And i um, just grateful to share this time and space with everybody. Um, yeah, so I have an untraditional path or maybe it's more traditional, who knows? Um, I essentially, you know, was uh, what was called a latchkey kid when I was a child and watched a ton of TV. And that, uh, that experience of just, you know, um, escaping into a different reality, um, I later realized characterized the way I see the world and um, the stories that I create from my experiences in the world. Um, as an adult, I first spent time in um, domestic violence advocacy. And, you know, in those moments of being a support to women and children, um, what I found just most humbling was the time in listening to them. And, you know, 
recognizing that that was just such a place of honor to be able to sit and be present and to listen to a person's story. As I transitioned out of that work, I went into um, uh, traditional medicine. And then uh, that's when I was approached by PBS to work on a project about Sobia Miller, who's um, a leader and then just an amazing human of the Skokomish peoples. Um, that was, I guess, nearing 20 years ago. So just finding that thread of being a deep listener, appreciating storytelling, um, and just honoring the process of kind of organic revealing and understanding that life is not linear, but circular. And I love that about the opportunities um, that I've been part of in community-driven filmmaking is that, you know, working together, it's not about me whatsoever, but working together with community oftentimes is this very organic process, but it offers these many opportunities to be a, a deep listener, to understand the ways that we all contribute to a, a greater fabric of understanding. And um, to do that kind of work also just means you gotta roll up your sleeves, <laughs> do the work. It's, it's not always glamorous. It's often very hard. It's a life choice. It's a full commitment. And um, there's, I would say whether this is healthy or not, not necessarily a division of myself in the environment or myself in the art or myself in the service to community. It's just all wonderfully wrapped together in the highs and the lows. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that with us. That's awesome. So Raven, it sounds like you've traveled a lot as a young person and then you met Tracy through her Superfly program. Can you tell us a little bit about those experiences and how they changed your life and impacted your creative work? Yeah. Uh, so I met Tracy when I was about 16. I just moved here from Hawaii. And before that, I'd moved around a lot before then as well. Um, and this was the first time that I was explicitly focusing on an indigenous film. Uh, a lot of my sort of revitalized ties to indigeneity uh, kicked off when I was in Hawaii, but actually being able to implement and recognize the power and the uh, impact that they have on not just me, but so many other people uh, really came about when I went in for a 36 hour film off. Um, <laughs> And shockingly still got some sleep. I got at least like six hours of sleep that night, but uh, it reminded me of the generosity and the reciprocity that can be um, achieved even as a young person when you do put your best foot forward and when you continue to uh, nurture your relationships. And that's something that Tracy has taught me uh, a lot about is like consistency and continuing to provide the best working and growing environment you can for young folks that you are um, in relationship with. And that has brought me to continuing to work with her on uh, various different projects and just catching up on things. So it's been really nice to have that, that connection. Yeah, that mentorship piece is so integral that we, you know, it's not all about the formal education, right? It's all about the continued community. Um, we're going to talk more about mentorship later because I think it's so much about what we do um, all the time. But I do want to get to know a little bit more about Jin also. So as a Korean Bolivian American, where did you grow up and how did that impact the kinds of stories that you tell? It's actually like almost an honor now that I can say I'm Korean Bolivian American because I don't think I ever grew up feeling like I belonged in any of those spaces. Um, you know, I was born in Bolivia to Korean parents and I was probably the only, or we were the only Korean family for miles. 
um, I've experienced overt racism since I was like three years old. Um, so it's very traumatic to like live in a place where like nobody looks like you. Um, and um, so I never really felt Bolivian enough, but I get to call myself Bolivian because I was born there. Um, but I also wanted to, um, you know, mention that Bolivia has 36 recognized indigenous peoples, um, including the Aymara, Quechua speaking people, Chiquitano, Guarani, and Moxeño. And there's a lot more, but, um, you know, those were uh, the, the main um, native, native indigenous people that we kind of like came to know when, when we were living there. And also um, when I was in the States, I grew up I grew up in, um, I'm actually calling in from the unceded territories of Chumash, Tangva, Kitch, so Los Angeles. And I grew up here since um, I was five. I was also undocumented. And so I went back to Bolivia when I was 15. And um, I never thought I could call myself American because of my undocumented past. I never thought I felt Korean enough when I went to Korea like twice or three times in my life. I never felt Bolivian enough. So today I'm like, Really, um, the reason why I label myself that way as a filmmaker is because I feel like those do inform the stories that I like to tell. And I really like the spaces in between these cultures. And I found myself thriving um, in between communities, like being able to bridge people's stories and bridge people's communities and where they feel like they belong or where they feel like they don't belong. So I guess I'm also a third culture kid, which is a new term that I've found recently. Um, and I've been able to connect with other third culture kids as well. So um, I don't know if I answered your question, but. <laughs> no, I, I mean, that's so beautiful. And I'm sure there's so many people watching right now that can relate exactly to that. I think there's this, there's this notion of homogeneity that is just not at all accurate you know, in real life, even though that may be portrayed in the screen particularly, I would say. So thank you. Yeah, I think it's really important that you bring your identity and your struggles with that into your work. So that's awesome. And how did you meet Tracy? I met Tracy in 2017. We were both part of the Firelight Media Impact Producing Lab. And I guess we will be talking more about what impact producing is down the road. But um, I saw Tracy and she had this presence, just drinking her wine. And I just kind of knew like, oh, I think we're going to be friends. And we we were like first friend or like she was my first friend. I don't know if she knew anyone else. But um, after that, we just went shopping that night and then just kind of hit it off. And there's just something really open and warm about Tracy. I just feel like she has this magic to instantly connect with people. Um, so yeah, ever since then, we've just been in touch. And when I started uh, producing Men's and Our Diverted, When Water Becomes Dust, the first person I thought of was Tracy. When we were looking for different producers and executive producers, we really wanted to make sure that our film was not just um, coming from like a Japanese American angle, but to really like elevate the crew and have Native American voices as well, Native American storytellers and not just like use the lens of the Japanese Americans to, um, I'm not Japanese American, but the directors, but to be able to tell the story in a more holistic way. So um, yeah, so Tracy is also our EP for this project. That was a fun night in Durham, South Carolina. <laughs> we were trying on clothes from this amazing African seamstress and it was memorable. Yes, <laughs> we'll never forget it. I love that it was such a unique uh, experience that you can can recall. And it's true, I have to say too, just even the, having talking on the phone with Tracy to sort of set up this event, I have to say she does, even through Zoom and phone, she has a very magical presence. So we'll get get, get you guys back to, uh, to Connecticut at some point in the real world. Um, so on to storytelling, because I think that's really, obviously we're all here because we're storytellers and we're, we're sharing really important things. Um, there's a concept that I often talk about with my own students about, uh, in regards to storying about the personal being the universal. Um, and each of you in different ways has told very personal stories through your films. Could, and this is directed to everyone. Um, could you talk a little bit more about the, some of the more difficult stories that you told through film and how you've um, found the courage to tell them? Anyone? 
wants to I mean, I can start. Yeah. Or Tracy, go for it. Oh, no, no, go for it, Raven. I was just going to ask if you could just repeat that one more time, please. Sure, sure. And go for it, Raven. <laughs> Each of you in different ways has told personal stories through your films. Can you talk a little bit about the most difficult stories you've told for film and where you found the courage to tell them? Because sometimes it hurts. For me, the most difficult piece that I've done thus far. I'm sure there are other more difficult pieces coming up, um, but there was one in college when I believe it was my junior year. Uh, there was a lot of traumatic stuff that happened in regards to death, dying, cheating, etc. Um, and it almost seemed too outlandish to be true, but by putting it in the context of one of the two people in the relationship coming home um, and you know one of those late night arguments that you have with a partner trying to work through it at that point i think that was the most difficult piece because i was going through it but it also made it the most um open but also heart-wrenching um so i wouldn't say so much it was courage as finding a way to work through what I was going through. Um, and so, of course, there were plenty of tears, but it serves as a way of, yeah, reminding me of what was happening at that time and that I just have to keep going, even if it seems like things are stagnant. Anyone else want to? share an idea about that for me my healing entire... part of it too right mm -hmm. the healing part of about telling those difficult stories i mean that's yeah for me my whole career really has been um you know in service and relationship to uplifting community although um my first love is for plant medicine and the environment. So much of the work I choose really, I guess, involves that and that kind of orientation or proximity. Um, during the pandemic, my father passed away and um, in going through his stuff, I'm learning so much about our family that I didn't know about. And um, so there's certainly for the first time in my life, I've been a filmmaker for 20 years, an interest in just what does it mean to kind of uncover hidden stories and complicated truths and recognizing our family has been mixed race and multicultural for at least 200 years. Um, and just finding that's an interesting story in itself when oftentimes um, narratives are presented as very binary or very singular. Um, and just recognizing that is certainly not the experience for many people living on these lands. Thank you so much for sharing that. I'm so sorry to hear about your dad. But that might be a future project you're exploring. Jin, anything you wanted to add about that? I don't I don't know if I I don't know if I ever thought about telling very hard to tell stories. But um, now that you mentioned it, I think the courage that I always find in these stories is the people that that need these stories to be told or, you know, like yeah. even with Manzanar Diverted, the shared history is devastating. You know, like if you look at all the people who had to die for Los Angeles's water and the people who were incarcerated, but the stories that emerged from that were the people who don't want you to forget, the people who are taking the reins to really just make sure no one does it again, right? And and then also, make, yeah, and then the shared history part is so important because there's a reason why we don't know each other's stories. It was actively left out in our teachings. So um, I think the impact portion of it, the, the residents and how we could, you know, reshape narrative is very powerful. So even in moments of great difficulty, if you find um, a piece of hope or something that could help people become more resilient, I think that's that's the piece where I always gravitate towards. Mm. 
And I think that's so important as, as documentary filmmakers, especially, and working with community and people that were, that are, it's such an honor when individuals are willing to share their stories with us, right? And then to present them in an authentic and, and honoring way. I mean, even if they're not our stories, it's still really hard to tell a lot of times. Um, Raven, your zine Qualifications of Being, which is such a personal and educational and touching comic, and your intimate VR experience and drive to top surgery was so simple, yet yeah, I already said this earlier, but I'll tell the public, um, gave such a beautiful window into your life and not, not only your emotions of that moment, but also your family dynamics. And first of all, I wanna thank you for sharing those stories because um, I think they're so important uh, and so special. Um, but in that piece, uh, you, you introduced to the, pu to the public to being a two spirit. And for those of us that don't know who, what that means, I'd love for you to explain um, a little bit about that process and, and what, what Two-Spirit means. Yeah. Um, also, Tracy slash Longhouse Media were the um, distributing and producing house behind the zine. So, um, so, Two-spirit was a term that came out also, if you look in the book on, I believe it's page 24 or 25, you can find a full blurb about what two-spirit is. Um, but essentially it's a political term that uh, people rallied around to be able to describe all of the different gender identities that exist across the continent. Um, so that we can all collectively advocate for our rights um, as native people of Turtle Island, the Americas, um, who are also not straight or not uh, cis. Um, and both of those are in reference to sexuality and gender assigned at birth. Um, and so for me, being Two-Spirit uh, has been very freeing. Of course, trans is um, something that I would also use to describe myself, but that Two-Spirit is so much more open and freeing for me as I continue to learn how I fit into sort of as uh, Jen was speaking, like all that, all those different little cracks that appear when you're not just one homogenous person. Um, and so I think that it is also a, a descriptor for the journey that I have been and continue to go on. That's wonderful to hear. I hadn't heard of the term before and I did a little bit of research and it's really nice to hear your experience with the term and what it means to you. So thank you for that. Moving over to Jen. Mans are diverted, weaves together the stories of intergenerational women from a variety of backgrounds, Native Americans, Japanese American, World War II incarcerates, and environmentalists. Can you talk about the film's approach to interweaving those stories together cohesively? Sure. Um, well, first of all, I think all three of these groups are environmentalists, um, just so everyone is on the same page, because I think some people might think that the environmentalists were just the two white sisters that were in the film. Um, everyone cares deeply about the environment in our film. And um, it was really hard to tell this story. Um, it took a lot of time. Um, it took a lot of negotiations with all of the communities that were portrayed. Um, and I don't know if it really came together until like maybe earlier this year when we were finally like, I think it's finally like starting to make sense. And uh, I will say like in the beginning of um, this film and Kaneko, the director, she, she didn't want to make like a talking heads movie. She didn't want to make an environmental film um, or a film that had such a strong call to action that like you immediately think it's an environmental film. I don't know like how, how best to describe it, but you know, like, you know, you're supposed to like go and vote some way or like do something. So um, she wanted to make a very almost like lyrical poetic piece that, and the most important thing was to show the shared history because, 
you know, um, what we started noticing in research was like the Japanese American descendants of um, incarcerates during World War II, they didn't know like the water story, right? And uh, maybe the Native Americans didn't fully know the Japanese American incarceration story. And, and we were thinking like, if these pieces of stories are all, um, there's holes in them, you know? So how can we bring this together so, you, you know, maybe the documentary could be the jumping off point to a deeper conversation of like, what else is a shared history that is being left out in our history books? Why is it that we don't know these things? Why is it not taught, you know, even at the college level? Like I didn't take my first Asian American studies course until college, but even at the college level, so many of these things are not taught, you know, and you know, if it's not taught and you don't know it, there's there you can't block it from happening again. And you can't band together with other communities and learn from them and share resources on how to to stop it from happening to another another community, another you know group of people. So for us, that was like the most important thing. Um, if you think it came cohesively together, then thank you. <laughs> we were trying really hard. Um, it went through a lot of iterations, and we think that. We are really proud of how it finally came to be. I did cry when I finally saw the final piece with the music and all like the sound design that Anne had thought in her head. And I was like, yes, it is a very poetic, meditative, spiritual film. You know, even if we can't see it in like a theater with other people in a shared room, I feel like at least like you get this feeling of um, getting closer to the land just by being there and with the meditative sound. So thank you. The trailer looked amazing. I am very excited to see it. So it, it looks like it really came together. I'm excited for it. So moving over to Tracy, this is a question that comes from one of my classmates, Joseph. He wants to know, what have been some of your favorite areas to film in? And are there any that you would like to film in or have already filmed in that resonate with your personal heritage? Mm. Um, well, first off, I just want to commend Jen and Anne for um, not only pulling it together and weaving it together well, but doing the incredible community work that was really necessary to do that. And I don't know many people who um, who take those steps. And, and I have witnessed uh, community acknowledge them in that way too, just going above and beyond. <laughs> so I think that too is an important ingredient. Um, so, and uh, where have I loved filming? Well, I'm just gonna be frank and honest. Hawaii is awesome. <laughs> Please, any projects in Hawaii, I would love to go back. <laughs> Pretty incredible. Um, I uh, have also been part of this project Out of the Muck, which takes place in Pahokee, Florida. And I don't even, I'm not sure if I can even find adequate words for that experience. It's such a gorgeous, mysterious, raw part of the country. And it's a place where you can literally be kind of walking down the road and you have to always be on guard if you're near water that an alligator can take you. I mean, it's just, you feel so elemental and, and well, at least I did and insignificant as a human in that landscape because, you know, it just, it, the environment <laughs> is so present and um, it's actually an incredible feeling to feel out of control in that way that just, you have to be aware. Um, Another aspect of that film is the just beauty of community and how generous community is. I think it's one of the most cash poor regions of the country, including, um, uh, yeah, um, for many reasons. But, oh my gosh, the generosity of the peoples off the hook, um, you know, just experiences of having family gatherings around the barbecue and people go out to the lake and, you know, catch 40 fish and serve it up to the, you know, everyone who comes by and just that sort of reciprocity that's needed to um, keep family together. And that story is specifically about six generations of family. Um, 
I have to be honest, though, ever since spending time there, I'm nervous around water sometimes. <laughs> it's just, it feels as though my uh, my survival instincts have <laughs> been turned up a notch that um, sometimes you have to be on alert. Um, and then in terms of my own culture, you know, my mom was born in Oklahoma, my uh, grandparents were born in Oklahoma, and um, even if that's where they um, were pushed towards or moved towards, um, that's still part of my family history and I've never been there and I have family there and um, our family holds stories there. So I, I really want to visit Oklahoma and learn more about that history one day soon. That's amazing to hear. And then to go off of that, how has um, intersectionality played a role in the stories you've decided to tell? Yeah, I think it's interesting. I mean, there's, mm, I mean, identity today, there's, wow, <laughs> so many conversations. And I feel like my entire life has been that. I, you know, <clears throat> was born in 1972. Um, in a time when there weren't many people like me being born. And, you know, really strongly from, you know, my family identifying as triracial, you know, at the time. And horrible words were used that I was comfortable with too as a kid. Like I just openly called myself a mutt or a Heinz 57 because there wasn't language and there wasn't context and there wasn't that kind of way to embrace complex identities in that time. And I never knew until an adult kind of how damaging that most likely was for just kind of my spirit, but it was also just what was said um, for people like me who aren't necessarily biracial or monocultural, even bicultural. Um, so anyhow, I just, I feel fortunate that I'm a result of many intersectional identities, especially with a um, lesbian mom too, who really brought um, me up considering so many other types of social responsibility as well. Um, and today, you know, my storytelling, I'm most attracted to stories that not many people are telling, that are afraid to tell, that are on the fringe, that are complex, and there's not a straight path forward. Um, I also, because of my multicultural identity, you know, always having identified as native black, Jewish and of European descent, I see that ambiguity and that place of nuance um, as an opportunity for me to be in service. So I'd say that's probably characterized my choices as a filmmaker is that I feel most comfortable being a listener and in service and creating opportunities for others. That is beautiful. And um, it's an interesting segue into the next question, which you know talks about um, the importance of, of the, telling these sort of stories. It's, but to, to set it up, I'm gonna sort of throw out there that there are hundreds of Native American tribes in the United States and through the long brutal history of forced removal and genocide by the US government. They're spread around and dislocated throughout the land. So in the title that you came up with for the, for the panel, which I love, you talked about indigenous solidarity. So what do you find are the best strategies for gaining shared community um, amongst indigenous peoples in the United States and abroad even? And how have digital methods opened up the possibilities for more unity among indigenous people? To someone specifically? <laughs> um, I think anyone could jump in on that, but yeah. I nominate Tracy to go first. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna pull you both in as well. <laughs> um, <clears throat> yeah, I mean, solidarity, each of us in our own ways, um, practice solidarity with indigenous people, specifically of Turtle Island. Um, 
whether it be, you know, myself as a multicultural person with indigenous roots creating, you know, programs that build capacity or in Jin's work, um, understanding the importance of centering narrative with the peoples whose land the story is being told upon, or Ravens who's incredibly intertribal and multicultural in their approaches. Um, I think it's a space that I appreciate how well we individually navigate, but also I think that this is an opportunity, a time period to um, talk about the work that it takes to be in solidarity, solidarity and to be in collaboration too. Because again, I, I think that's a theme here is that it takes work, it's not easy. Um, in you know, my estimation, you know, with the three of us, none of our paths have been easy. And I think that characterizes our work ethic too and our approaches. And our commitment to being solidarity means showing up, rolling your sleeves up, um, and thinking outside of what the norms are that are set, um, which also means creating new systems. And in doing so, always listening, you know, not projecting, not being hierarchical, being in collaboration and really paying attention to what's being asked. I'm gonna call in Jen. <laughs> um, I think, you know, it, it is really difficult work to bridge communities, um, but I think the upside and, and like what you get from really seeing people coming together is like, it will change you. Um, it really will. Sorry, I'm gonna. <laughs> I'm not gonna crack. Um, but I think it, within that space, um, there should be grace given too, because we don't always speak the same language. We don't always have the same protocols. We don't always have um, maybe you know the right way to say things, right? And as much as we want to, we're going to bring ourselves into it. So, um, you know. I just think that there, there's always a, as long as you have like the line of communication open, you can negotiate these things and, you know, like really show where your intentions are and really see like how powerful it could be when people come together. Um, but yeah, it is, it is difficult. And sometimes it's, it's, that piece is longer than the filmmaking part, right? Like currently our film is out, we're doing film festivals, but um, we're still having conversations with different people, you know, about their roles in the films or like how best we could use the film to you to help what they're doing, um, what's next, right? Like what can, like can, a film cannot stop racism or like, you know what I mean? Like one film isn't gonna be able to change the world that way, but it's really just a piece of the puzzle with everything else that's happening, all the people who are already working in, in what they're doing and how can they use the film to continue on having like deeper discussions. Um, like we're not allowed to use the film to lobby for like legislative change because of, you know, where we got our money from, like some grants have some limitations, but that doesn't mean someone else can't use it, you know? So there's a little bit of like wiggle room. And I think just like trying to find those spaces and seeing like how, how you can grow from those kinds of conversations can really help. Um, Raven. <laughs> I'm like, I just want to applaud what's been said already. Um, and that at least for as far as, let me, Click back to the question real quick. Best strategies for gaining shared community. Honestly, the only way that I know to do that is to just be as completely transparent with my experiences um, in relation to whoever I'm talking with and their experiences and just going from there and seeing um, how we connect and how our shared struggles can be um, how we can be liberated together. And so uh, for not just indigenous people, but for people across the continent and honestly the world, digital mediums, when you can act 
access them where you are uh, is incredibly powerful in being able to instantly communicate with people and be able to share um, different ideas and different ways of being. Mind you, there's a lot of politics when that comes into play as to who does and does not have access to electronics, the internet, um, and many other things that are necessary for that digital world, for accessing that digital world. But working on that infrastructure and being able to um, even connect with folks who are moving to cities is incredibly important in both the eco local ecosystem of um, indigenous nations, especially here in Coast Salish territory in Seattle. Um, it's incredibly important to recognize, of course, the people who are here, the people who are not federally recognized, as well as the plethora of nations that we have traveling all over the um, all over the continent constantly. And they always have been. Um, and so I think that recognition that we have always been moving around and interacting with one another, whether that be the blue beads from Venice that made their way to Alaska before Columbus did, um, to the folks from, to some of the um, Vikings who landed in uh, Nova Scotia, in I believe it was the 1100s, there has been interaction even across continents that I think we need to recognize um, and also recognize how we have all been pitted against one another for only a few um, people's gains. And so that our liberation truly is through each of us working together. Yeah, I brought tears. <laughs> to kind of go off of that collaborative idea, can you explain what liberation-based collaborations are and the transformations that occur through them? Raven, please. <laughs> Look at what bit me in the butt asking you <laughs> first. Um, liberation-based collaborations. See, I'm honestly thinking of, of Jin's um, film with Nans and are diverted in that at first, um, just from my perspective, I was like, oh great, we're starting with the native stuff and then we're going to move on, but we didn't move on. We stayed together with them. We saw them interwoven and we saw, even now how I'm learning about what you've done is that there's that constant communication and recognition of where people are at and where those holes can be filled by the recognition of others' struggles. And so I think that recognition that no one is above one another in what your struggles are and that we have all faced incredible trauma um, that we still need to work through, but that we are here to work through that and to work through that and learn from one another together is uh, where that liberation-based collaborations um, really serve to help us transform ourselves and transform our communities. Jin. This is turning I, into a tear fest. I'm I, so inspired. I, I mean, I don't think I've ever like held back tears so much from being just totally inspired and engaged in this conversation. I'm sorry. I honestly, I don't know if I've ever heard that term before, but the way you described it, Raven, I think that is that was our intention, right? And and um, even like, you know, recently I heard, you know, with the shootings in Atlanta, a lot of people were saying like, we stand in solidarity with the Asian American community. And, um, and that was nice to hear, but you know, like who's going to remain standing? And I think that's a good question. And what you brought up Raven is like, it's not just like being there when things happen or like the origin story or whatever. It's like, how do you remain with people? How do you remain standing together like throughout, right? So you're always there. So it's not just like conveniently there when, you know, like when things happen, but like, that's how you know, I think that's how you really do build community is just like being there through the highs and lows and not just when it's low or, not, you know, not just when it's high. So 
Um, but I, I actually like, I have to admit, I never heard of that term before <laughs> liberation based collaboration, but I think I'm going to put that in my like morning mantra because <laughs> it's really great. I think we're all going to be appropriating that term in what we do. <laughs> Is that all right, Tracy? Because she came up with that. I think I love it. No, Raven came up with that. Uh, and it was an incredible, incredible example of I how, love it. or well, at least Raven shared the term with me. I'm not sure if Raven came up. I don't with even it. remember sharing that term, but well, it cool. left I'm glad that it helped. Obviously, because she shared it with us. Well, so incredible. It, we could say it emerged out of the conversation Raven and I had, which is hilarious and awesome and interwoven and inspired. And I think that um, signifies or exemplifies the quality of our relationship as, you know, you know, perhaps as a mentor, I'm also a mentee. That's right. And I feel that to be true. Well, and Jen, I think at that point, you know, this is the thing that's been frustrating. You know, we've had so many conversations and particularly with my Asian American friends about the microaggressions and the, in, you know, inverted uh, um, issues. And, you know, I'm just really getting frustrated with the fact that it takes, you know, murder of people in whatever case your example to bring people together in solidarity. Like it has to be that long haul. Like we're looking at the long game, not just the immediate issue. Um, but that's where this comes in, this idea about, you know, I think we're at a point now, I think, in documentary filmmaking where this community-based work and um, thinking about the impact, you know, I, I consider this an impact panel, right? We're here together to talk about, like, what is the meaning of the work beyond the film? And I think so many filmmakers now are not satisfied with the idea that my work is done when the film goes onto the screen and that's it, right? So. And thank God we've gotten away from like, you know, Nanook of the North where document, you know, people come, white men come in and, and uh, appropriate and, and leave. Um, anyway, so impact producer, Tracy and Jin, you both have this in your title. And I think this is really important. And I know a lot of uh, young people are out there wondering, what does this mean? And what kind of work do you do in that specific role? Because it's somewhat new in filmmaking. So if you could kind of talk about what that work involves, I think that would be fantastic. Sure. I first heard of the term maybe around, I would say, 2014 or 15. And when I heard it, it was through um, uh, both Molly Murphy and Sonia Childress. Molly's with Working Films and at the time Sonia's with Firelight Media. And when they were talking about this space or this path of impact producing, I was like, oh my God, that's exactly what I do. <laughs> it just means you wear all the hats and <laughs> you get the story to, you know, create change in the world and get it out to people and community. Um, so for me, it was a sense of freedom and belonging and hearing the term um, because it felt incredibly, uh, circular and interwoven in the approaches and that there wasn't just kind of one prescription um, for doing the work either. Um, so as I understood impact producing, it's really, you know, you're part of, you know, if you're so lucky to, you're part of shaping the narrative of the film and um, in doing that, understanding the deeper themes and um, by that process, creating community connections and relationships. So when that film is released, that it has an opportunity to either impact policy, to be, to be seen on the ground by the people for those who really want to see it or need to see it, um, or to just get out there broadly, oftentimes um, films by underrepresented voices because of you know white supremacy and systemic racism and all the institutions um, oftentimes don't have um, platforms or avenues to get out there. So it's also part of the work, just you know making space, creating new systems, um, knocking on doors, <laughs> not you know taking no for an answer and just being really creative about how to um, get the work out there into the world. Um, I love it. I also love challenges. And I think impact producing is all about um, bringing solutions to the table, 
thinking through creative challenges and exploring new ways of thinking. It always, in my experience, calls upon the producer to think outside the box and um, think holistically too. Um, it's been awesome. And it was a dream to be asked to come on to Donland um, to really formally exercise you know, my impact producing muscles. Um, with the title of impact producer, it taught me a lot, but it also allowed me to um, see how much I've learned and gained in um, the work that I had done up until that time. And that's also how Jen and I came to, you know, become friends and colleagues was through this platform of impact producing. So going off of that, can you tell us a little bit about Upstander and Neo Terra's reciprocity project? Sure, happy to. Um, can I um, uh, give Jen just a moment to reflect? I saw their mute button go. Oh off. yeah, I'm so sorry. Oh no, no worries. Um, I realize I I am now uh, an impact producer as much as I am a documentary producer. Um, I feel like I'm still like learning as I'm going, um, but I think the reason why I love impact producing, and sometimes I just join a project just to impact produce, and sometimes I carry on my producing work into impact producing, um, but that's the reason why I wanted to go into documentary filmmaking in the first place, right, was to make sure that I can, I mean, this is cheesy, but like most documentary filmmakers want to change the world and that's why they're in documentary filmmaking and um, or to uncover truths or like tell stories that like need to be heard or um, the storytellers want it to be told. And so um, like when I heard of impact producing, similarly, I think um, maybe a little later, I think then Tracy, I heard it around 2016, that uh, term being used. I had no idea like what the difference was between impact producing and outreach and engagement, marketing, distribution. It was all like, at that time I was just a filmmaker. So all these terms were like, things I have to deal with later. Like, I don't have to think about that right now. I just need to get this film finished. Um, but as we get, you know, as we got to the stage of being later and then starting to think about like, what do I want my film to do? Do I, do I just want it to be seen by people? Do I want it to like um, do something and what is it? And going through the Firelight Media Impact uh, Producing Fellowship, it was like, learning, it was like almost like, wow, there's just so much more to this than I thought. Um, it's not just changing the world in this vague concept, but it's, do you wanna change minds, behaviors, culture, infrastructure, um, you know, like, and how, like, and we did all these exercises, like theories of change, pitching the project with like a clear call to action. And then seeing all these like um, impact producers from different fields coming from community work, a lot of them, I think most of them came from community work and then there are a bunch of film from filmmaking world that we're trying to learn the tools. But the fact that a lot of these tools emerge from community organizing made sense to me. Like, yes, of course, like we're trying to use film to change communities and to be of use to communities and be a tool for them. So um, I love it. I, I didn't mention this in my bio, but I'm impact producing a feature documentary right now called Try Harder, which is a, a feature documentary that premiered at Sundance and it's tracking high achieving students at Lowell High School in San Francisco as they're navigating the college admissions process. And it's like a lighthearted, but also like looking, hum, humanizing these students and looking at the stresses that they're under, the immense stress. No one thinks of like high risk kids as, you know, high achieving kids, right? They think, they think like, oh, um, you know, um, low resource schools or, or low income, but they're not thinking like, you know, perfect SAT score kids are at high risk, but they are, you know, there's uh, very high suicide rates. There's a lot of um, unchecked mental health. There's a lot of taboo around access to mental health. And so we just had a brain trust like right before this panel and just like having that conversation at this time when there is such a rise in hate crimes against Asian Americans about a feature documentary that centers Asian American students and the silent toll that they go through, right? And the burdens of it and not having anyone to really talk to about or feeling like their feelings and stress are not valid. Like what kind of conversations can we drive right now, especially like in this moment of time when people are listening? So um, I think that was the other piece of impact producing is like um, kind of like the time piece. Like where are we in this moment in history? Where are we today? 
what can we do today that could affect something in the future for you know our the next generation our kids so um but yeah i i get all the feels every time <laughs> every time we talk about impact producing because i'm like this is why we're doing this work So true. So do, Tracy, is that a good transition then to talk a little bit about Upstander? Because I think it's a good example and um, maybe uh, me yeah, Tara also. Yeah, yeah. Um, to what Jen said, it, it really is all about timing. It's kind of also about being a digital intuitive <laughs> and just, you know, understanding kind of collective consciousness and streams of consciousness. Um, and I think, you know, in my work today at Neotero, um, we're a global organization and we work globally in solidarity with indigenous peoples. And um, what I'm learning is how do we think on these kind of, I've been driven through my whole life by intuition and how do I employ these skills of community organizing, storytelling, um, capacity building, skill building, you know, all the while trying to understand the complexities and diversities of global indigenous realities and the social issues faced globally by indigenous peoples in concert with climate change. Um, and it really is, it's about scanning, scanning, scanning. It's all about timing. Um, it's trying to understand, you know, what are, what's at play. Um, and so it's an honor. It's a huge learning curve. Um, and it's humbling too. It's, it's a recognition of the work that needs to be done. And um, also understanding, you know, what is my role in that work? What is our role collectively as an organization at Neoterra too? And how, when we act locally, it truly does impact globally. Um, you know, that's always a phrase that I've heard and I believe in, but working in a global context is allowing me to see that too. When, you know, Jin's working in San Francisco, how that's, that story becomes universal. When Raven's talking about a cedar seedling in Coast Salish territories, how that story will become will become universal, even to somebody who may be in, say, India. They'll understand that that intimate connection with life. Um, so that's that's a lesson that I've come to in this work. Um, remembering that we also have to center local action. Um, and then in terms of upstander project, they're doing the same thing truly in um, Wabanaki territories in the East Coast, the, um, where the Don rises, the people of the Don. Um, so Maine into New England. Um, I have to say that I am so incredibly blessed and lucky to work with Adam Mazo and Mishi Lesser. They're the co-directors of Donland. And you know, it was talked about earlier in our conversation about commitment and hard work and um, staying in it for the long haul. They've been doing this work, I think, going on a dozen years, really um, investigating, inquiring about, um, you know, the impacts of genocide, you know, whether it be in Rwanda or of Wabanaki peoples or indigenous peoples on Turtle Island, um, really walking their talk as allies and being brave in sticking with it and going through the highs and the lows and not shying away from when stuff gets hard. Um, anyway, that's, I think, uh, for me, um, at the heart of impact producing too. And that it, it, it just rings back to other threads that we've shared here is that, you know, it's, it's about being authentic and it's about being in relationship and it's about doing the work. Yeah. I'm going to ask, I asked Mike to put the, uh, the um, link to Dawnland in there. It's available on the uh, 
um, PBS website. And it's just such a powerful, powerful film and a powerful example of community working together and truth and reconciliation, which, you know, there just isn't enough of that. And if we could get to that point with people coming together, I mean, that's what this is, is so much about. Um, and you can't have reconciliation with truth. So reconciliation still a ways away. Exactly. First, we have to practice truth telling. Yeah. yeah. Well, and then so we think about impact, you know, an, a small level of that is mentorship. Um, mentorship to our young people is perhaps the most integral aspect of what we do in, in education, I would argue anyway. People probably would disagree, other people, but that's my thought. Um, and I love that Tracy and Raven, you have this incredible relationship. Um, and Jen, you appear, you and Tracy have also become really, really close as well. So what can you share a little bit about your relationship? I know this is really personal, I'm sorry, um, about being the mentee, being the mentor, and what you've both gained from that close relationship. You go, Raven. Okay. <laughs> I was going to say, you're asking me a personal thing. Have you seen my work? You have seen my work. <laughs> It's all personal, but it's all like good personal. Um, yeah, Tracy's been there since I really started. So when I moved here from Hawaii, I was like, okay, I am going to come out. I'm going to just like be out when I go to high school here. And I did. And then later in college, I was also like, oh, I have another transition to do. Cool. Let's let's come out a second time and then a third time with being two spirits. I'm like, okay, cool. I think we're good. I think we've done all the coming out. Well, actually, no, we're always changing. We're humans. Um, but Tracy has been there for all of those big ups and downs of really growing into what it means for me to be an adult and doing film and like where I really want to make an impact. And so, um, at least for a lot of my work, it has been a piece about like, okay, what does my younger self need or what did they need? Um, and so I think that's something that I still focus on. Um, and like, of course I do some work with youth now. Um, and I keep thinking, okay, well, what do you need? And I'm here for you. And, um, just how to continue to support them as I see them come into myself into themselves um, and so it's sort of like we're all supporting one another in whatever ways that we can with our insights um, with what generation we're a part of and so it's really yeah it's really grounding Tracy do you want to and fun too <laughs> I just yesterday <laughs> We laughed so hard for, I don't know, an hour and a half, um, just going over the questions. And I think, um, oh, am I aging myself? It's like when I'm around <laughs> young people, I feel like I'm more than no. <laughs> so I'm always so grateful. And it's, um, you know, I... I've lived life and I've made a ton of mistakes and that's offered, you know, opportunity to gain some wisdom through making mistakes. And um, that's great, but I also appreciate the learning that comes from having, uh, you know, intergenerational experiences and, um, you know, listening to and learning from diverse voices. And so it's also just awesome to know Raven. Um, you know, because I'm committed to being a lifelong learner and just, you know, student. And so there's that aspect as well. But also there's, um, you know, I, I think, I think there's ways that I recognize people around Raven's generation who's maybe a year younger than Chai, my oldest adult human person. <laughs> I don't I'm want to 24. say general. Oh yeah, she's 25 and a half. I still say and a half because I'm a mom. Um, <laughs> but um, wow, that generation and my youngest son, Salman, who's almost 20, 
wow, just not caught up in the same crap that we are um, in this generation of people born in the 70s and 80s. Just a different way of, um, I would say, being uh, open to the fluid, na fluid nature of human existence and recognizing that we're all on this journey together. And um, I just see so many barriers being broken down and just like ways of being that that generation specifically um, are so liberated um, and interconnected and multicultural and intersectional and, um, and hurting too, you know, and expressing that hurt and pain in ways that maybe I wish my generation knew how to do. Um, so it's so it's a gift. It's a gift to be um, surrounded by different ages of people, whether I need mentors as well, you know, for that reason too. Um, but mentors, you know, from other generations, um, because in so many regards, Raven's a mentor. I was going to say that there's this reciprocal relationship because, well, time is also reciprocal in how we we learn from it um, and that we wouldn't be here without all the fighting and all of the, um, at times, silence that people have to go through to be able to survive. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it's constant work to have all of us heal from that, whether or not, whether that is um, them themselves at this moment or um, ancestors in the future doing that healing. It's, it's just something that we're all processing. So I think that that recognition of what has come before is very, um, very much needed when you do step into any sort of community work, so. And especially it's highlighted when you get to interact with a singular person and get to know their story. So yeah, I'm very grateful. Thank you and so much. Having, having the opportunity of working with Jen and knowing Jen first met her director, Anne, as a fellow and to see, you know, over the years that I've known them as part of Manson are Diverted, that blossom too, that's been an unfolding. Yeah, you read my mind. That's actually the next question, <laughs> specifically about Jin, your work with Anne, um, and what aspects of your working relationship stemmed from a place of education and learning with Anne, and then how has your relationship with one another evolved throughout your process of filmmaking? So it's really wonderful to hear everyone's take on mentorship because yeah, Anne was my mentor. Like she in two thousand seven. I was doing this program called Armed with a Camera Fellowship through Visual Communications. And she was the artist mentor. It was her first year as a mentor for that program. You know, and it obviously it was my first year as a fellow to it. And um, I was really scared of her. Like she like came off really stern. Like I already talked about this with her, she knows. So I, I can say it again. But when I first met her, I was like, she's really like mean and stern. And like, and I was like never there because I had way too many things going on and um I just thought like after that program ended like we were not really going to have a relationship but you know the community is really small and I kept bumping into her and she really likes my husband who was always punctual and gave really great notes and was like a standout student and I think because I married him she was like really nice to me too <laughs> But, you know, in the meantime, like I went to film school, like I grew as a person, I stopped taking on like as many projects and I wasn't as all over the place. And she, when she first asked me to join this um, project, I was really shocked. I was like, you want me? Cause I don't know if you like me. Um, so since 2017 until now, like our relationship has really blossomed. And I want to say like, there's two types of mentors, maybe there's more, but these are the two types that I like have come to know. There's the mentor who like will tell you what to do, will give you all the advice and, you know, more or less fade away, come back whenever you need them. And then there's mentors who are like, they don't really treat you that differently from like their own peers, right? So like, for example, I think Tracy, you are one of those people. And Anne is also one of those people where um, she equalized the playing field right away so that I became a partner. 
Um, so like about a couple years into working with her, we became like, you know, actual partners in our LLC. And I feel like every generation has their own like trauma or baggage or whatever it is growing up in that generation has. And what I've noticed was that Anne for a long time made films by herself. Like she didn't really um, seek institutional support or um, maybe she thought the stories were important, but it was hard enough. It was hard enough already for her to just make it. And so that was like one thing I felt like in my generation, I was like, it's all about institutional support and community support. So that's one thing I feel like I really helped her see. So I feel like this relationship between me and her is it has blossomed over the years. I don't think she's mean or stern anymore. <laughs> like we definitely feel like friends, you know, like we're both moms of young kids. Um, I could see myself hanging out with her. Like we share a lot of space now. Um, so I think that this mentorship, mentor mentee relationship could take any form, but I think for the mentor to be able to want to learn from the mentee, I think that that catalyzes like a more deep relationship. Um, and it's inspired me to become a better men mentor too, you know, because before I was like that other type of mentor that was like, here's my advice. Don't work at this company because they're toxic or don't do this. Oh, I wish I had someone tell me, telling me this when I was your age. Um, but now I'm like, okay, I need to learn how to be a better mentor too. And just like, listen better, ask better questions. I think that's what Tracy does really well is, you know, as our EP, like we come to her, like sometimes we're like crying. We're like, what do we do? And, and Tracy's like, well, and then she just asks these really good questions. And I'm like, yeah. And then we just process it. And it, it feels um, like more of a collaborative, like building of uh, relationships versus like top down. And I think that is so integral, especially for our young viewers out there right now, um, to understand that that relationship, the relationships you build and the mentorships you go, and it's a continuous process. You're not done learning, even if you're finishing film school or whatever you're doing, that even, you know, us in our 40s, <laughs> you know, can we still need those relationships to thrive and they can change over the years. I think that's that's like a, 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 a such a great thing to consider, even though I never thought of it until this moment. So thank you both for for that. I'm going to switch gears. We've got, Tracy's got a, a, we're going over time, but it's going great. And we've got 50 viewers. So this is pretty amazing. Um, but I want to touch on this because you brought up, Jin, a little bit about this in, in, in this. I think what's really cool about this, the mentoring that has happened with, with um, women in particular, um, I think is really, really important. But we know from the USC Annenberg Inclusion Initiative studies that the film industry is dominated by a white male cis perspective and that there is no way uh, represent, that no way represents the world around us. Um, and that indigenous girls are erased at the highest percentage of any group. Um, just three of the top 100 films of 2019 showed any Native Americans, women whatsoever on screen. And out of 26,618 speaking characters from 600 films since 2014, there were only three transgender. So when we are looking at the directors behind the camera, the statistics are equally as abysmal. So it makes the work that you all are doing so very, very, very much more important and integral, especially for the future of storytelling. So can you share your passion about getting more diversity into the film industry? And this is for any of you. So just un unmute and jump in. Um, I just texted my meeting in uh, to ask for just a few more minutes. Um, um, Yeah, I was on a panel maybe two weeks ago with the Gates Foundation. And it was stated a recent poll of kind of media makers in the end of the industry that 88% of the industry is white males. And that's gone up. When I first started doing this work 20 years ago, as 85%. And so despite all of these incredible initiatives, all these badass 
you know, femme, non-binary, like creative peoples, um, BIPOC peoples, all the peoples supporting one another and the new initiatives, why is it going up? And so that's just something that's been sitting actually with me for two weeks. I'm not sure what the answer is other than, of course, white supremacy and, you know, that system is intact and those in charge are afraid and holding on to power and only sharing power with those that they know. Um, but it, it still does baffle me. I mean, there's these just amazing initiatives like Firelight Media is off the hook or Black Star is a film festival or, you know, who's running stuff now. Um, there's people in place who look like us, who look like me, um, but we're still going backwards somehow. I don't get it, to be honest. And that's part of my passion of creating new systems. Like we can't, it's just uh, like Audre Lorde's quote, that's a, you know, the beginning of the description for this. We can't be using those same old tools. We can't be thinking that we're gonna fix it. We have to just, you know, say that's nonsense and work together to create something new. Yeah, um, I I think the documentary field might be slightly different, um, which is also partly why I'm here, I guess. <laughs> I was like running away, uh, trying to find safe spaces. Um, but that's not to say the documentary world is safe. Uh, I learned a hard way that it wasn't. Um, but fortunately, I think the last couple of projects I've worked on were helmed by uh, women of color, mostly women team. And um, sometimes we we look around, like today's brain trust was all women. And I was like, wow, that wasn't totally on purpose, but there was some intention behind it, but it wasn't totally on purpose. So it's not like people don't exist. I think if you just make some effort to whatever you know demographic you want it to look like, I think, it is possible to do it, but I guess I don't really, I also don't know like how, you know, what the solution is, except just to hire each other, look around and make sure, you know, you know, just take that extra step and don't say like, oh, we were trying, but we couldn't find it. Or like, my favorite is like, oh, one time we hired this person, this person of X background and it didn't work out. That person was bad. And it's like, okay, well, you could hire like a hundred more and see if all hundred of them are bad, you know, like, and what do you mean by bad? Like what, you know, what are you centering there? And, you know, and I've heard this from like liberal white progressive spaces. So it's not like, oh, it was like in the red state, you know what I mean? It's like, these are people who I've respected um, you know, who like were Oscar contenders like that I worked for and I was like baffled at like the thinking around it. Um, so when now I when I work with people, I just like make an active effort like for Manzanar Diverted, we made an active effort to find Native American filmmakers who could join our team, Native American impact producers. It, it, it wasn't easy, but, but it's like, if you want to do it, you can. So don't say you tried and then like show the result of it. That doesn't look like you tried that hard. I think part of that's visibility too, right? And um, that's uh, Illuminative led by Crystal Echohawk is doing incredible work in creating visibility. So there are no more excuses, right? It's like, no. <laughs> Here are the tools and do the work because you can't rest on your excuses anymore. It's just not possible. Yeah, and I would say that there's a lot of um, really great databases now that have been formed in the last couple of years. Brown Girls Dog Mafia is a face, it was a Facebook group, but now we have our own database. I think there's like thousands of people on that database. I'm, I also belong to Asian American Doc Network, which is Asian American documentary filmmakers. You know, at first we thought we were only a hundred, that's also like over a thousand. So it's like, there's groups, I'm sure you can find them now. Like that's like the great thing about technology. It doesn't take that long to find people if you're really looking. 
And that's the key, right? You, you have to want to look. I mean, it's so interesting because we're like, we there's a lot of discussion about broken systems, but like nobody wants to really talk actively about the film industry or media in general being completely broken. Um, and I, it's interesting because all these concepts that we're talking about in regards to community organizing and bringing back, bringing together stories and sharing stories, I mean, in a way, we have to look at those platforms that they're being shared on almost equally and who's behind the camera, who's doing all the work. Um, yeah, that's that's the long game, I guess, to change that, you know, one mentor at a time, one incredible program, like what you do at Longhouse, Longhorse and, and uh, Neotero. Okay. And, yeah. <laughs> you know, it's like, it's, it's, um, yeah, I, I don't know. I just, I have so many ideas and it's inspiring me to, to look at the long game, you know, that, that we have to have the endurance and the persistence to keep, you know, struggling for, for everyone. And again, I think normalizing um, so panels like this, like how how can we help get one another out into the world? And like, right. this is the face of filmmaking. These are the faces of filmmaking. These people are amazing and talented and not niche, but doing the work. Um, here's an emerging animator. Here's an incredible impact producer. Here's a strong visionary multimedia creator, you know, just like, it's all about messaging and branding. And right now the branding's, you know, very homogenized and words are power. Thoughts are power, give way to words, give way to actions. And they just feel like we all have to do our best to really look at what the messaging is and push back and make new messaging. And that's what I've learned about watching Illuminative too. They're all about, it's about visibility. It's about putting people forward it's about giving space and then that starts changing hearts and minds and actions and that and that representation matters so much because the young people need to be able to look out and aspire to say i see people that look like me that are doing what i want to do right and it comes back to tracy you know you and i are the same age and I talk with my kids, my daughters, the same time all like they can't understand the concept of like when I was watching a kid on television, you saw almost no people of color. You know, you saw only cis relationships, you know, there was no difference. So I am hopeful in our young people that they understand, even, even though we can complain about the media, at least there's somewhat more diversity, it's still problematic. But, um, you know, that representation, and what we see is so integral to the future of changing the narrative. And also recognizing in the in all of the maybe niche as uh, maybe a cis white male might take it, um, even in those stories that are very much not like what the person who is watching it may experience, there is still that truth to what is being told and there's that recognition. Um, like Tracy was saying, like someone in India might have never seen a uh, cedar tree, but it doesn't really matter. There is that recognition of relationship and humanity um, yeah. that is inherent to what the person is experiencing in the piece. And also that between the like three trans folks and the three native <laughs> women, I'm like, oh boy, just try and find someone like me. So that's why I'm, that along with the power that being perceived male gives me, not male, but whatever. Um, that's why I always try and throw it on people's uh, like twist things around. I'm like, oh yeah, back when I was a lesbian <laughs> and just like keep breaking down those perceptions. If you think you've gotten there, keep going. So I love, that. I still do that. I love so. that bit in the, in the zine where you talked about that, that, uh, change in, in portrayal and or interpretation, I should say, I guess more. And but it does bring up a good point about where how that all matters and lens and how you see things and that empathy, right? That we're able to jump into other another person's shoes and understand like, and that's where this community work. I mean, incredible. I know Sydney, you've got um I, I, we're, we're about to close. We've got a couple of good questions and a really great comment and question from the audience. So Sydney, why don't you ask the next 
Sure. So this one comes from another one of my classmates, Christina, who asks, what advice do you have for students looking to tell more diverse stories, but don't know where to start? And that could be for anybody, whoever wants to take it. Don't know where to start in terms of like what's, what's resources beginning? maybe is that I think what Christina was talking about. So I was thinking of the ones you were talking about earlier. Sorry, what did you say? Maybe resources. Oh, resources. Um, I mean, this is really cliche. Everyone always says this, but I'm going to say it because it's true. You just have to do it. Just tell your own story. Start from yourself. I think uh, one of the bigger mistakes is when people just want to tell a diverse story. So then they go looking for that elsewhere. And then that's really problematic because you shouldn't, first of all, maybe one day you can and then make it relevant to yourself. But as a first time emerging storyteller, it would be problematic to go and tell someone else's story first for many reasons. But I think you should just start from yourself and find that story that really means something to you. 100% other people are gonna also find meaning from that. Authenticity. My thought, or Tracy, I know that you're running short on time. Is there anything you wanna say? Yeah, I would say a volunteer. Just um, there's, you know, there's, I would say for young indigenous peoples, there's, quite a bit of movement happening nationwide, especially in Canada, but nationwide, um, with just great online resources and opportunities to start listening and learning and connecting socially. Um, but also, I recognize that a lot of Indigenous makers and BIPOC makers are DIY and are often you know, posting on local film boards or in social media groups of just like, hey, you wanna make a film together or, um, uh, or yeah, just you know, looking for PAs, for example, but just show up, volunteer, don't be afraid to make mistakes. Like Jen said, tell your own stories, start small, work your way up. And um, if you really are interested in more formal educations, I'm noticing that there's a number of fellowships that um, are developing and community-driven nonprofits, um, such as BayVac or In Progress, um, that have diverse programs and mentors and opportunities. Um, and those oftentimes lead towards you know, creating communication and relationship with like school programs and more formal routes towards education. Um, but I would say there's no wrong way. And that's what the beauty is of this work is there's so many paths to get to where you wanna go. And that's just being open and willing to write that email, to send that FB message, to you know, send someone an Instagram post and say, you know, hey, anytime you need, um, I would love to help you out and just um, not be shy. And that can be hard for some people, but just, just try. Piggybacking off of that, I think letting people know where you're at, but also putting in the work and recognizing when you do like have to apologize and where are you going to take that apology? Because inevitably all of us are going to make mistakes, but you have to make something out of that. And you have to keep going and learning from that. Uh, and I think that starts with listening. So just listening to yourself and others. I'm like, everyone has incredibly diverse stories already, um, whether that even be from a purely European background um, or from a Korean Bolivian American who inevitably um, has a lot of other stories about being here um, and just making your way around the continent. It's just, yeah, we already have such incredible stories we have to tell. Um, so don't discount yourself. <laughs> so just try and be authentic and try and be yourself. 
There's a lot of people who are primed and ready to help too. I think about Pacific Islanders and communication, for example, just how much community work they're aware of or imaginative in Toronto. I mean, there's people who are, and the um, uh, Brown Girls Doc Mafia, of course, uh, but armed with the camera fellowship that Jen just put in um, the chat. Like there's... There's groups, people want to help. So remembering that you're not alone and people really are uh, willing and ready to lift you up. And I mean, I think this is um, also a very tangible ask, but if you saw a film that you really liked um, and you find our website and there's a contact us button, just send them an email, say, hey, I'm, I want to intern for you over the summer. Like that's how we got like a couple interns that way. Um, it feels like, you know, out of nowhere or cold email, but it does work because filmmakers are always looking for extra help, especially during the summer, right before the fall for like their fall initiatives. I mean, I'm looking for interns right now. So like, contact me, you know. <laughs> so um, I think every everyone like just um, put your foot out there in terms of learning. And um, there's a lot of opportunities and people who really want to bring up the community. So um, just look a little. Yeah, you'll find it. And I think even with that, just gratitude and extending that, even if it is a, a cold thank you or what is touched to you, I think is always appreciated because there's out of thousands of people who may have uh, watched the film, just getting that one email back about how impactful it was. Oh, love it. And Jin, Men's and Our Diverted did not feel choppy at all. I loved it. Thank you. <laughs> All right, we're gonna try and squish in one more question from someone in the audience, Lauren Todd, who teaches a women, gender and film class here at UConn. And they ask how, sorry, they were wondering how they can best incorporate your films and support your work in their class. If I could just say goodbye quickly, because I have to go. Um, so I just want to say thank you to everyone here and to the audience and to whomever may see this in the future. This is an awesome conversation and I hope it can continue and I hope our relationship with UConn can continue as well. Thank you, Tracy, so much. And we'll, do it. we'll, we'll uh, promote your, your, your two organizations one last time too, but we will be in touch. I, that's a promise soon. Sounds good. Thank you. See you. See ya. Yeah, so Jen, how you and me first. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you go first. <laughs> okay, cool. Um, <clears throat> I think in a lot of things in the world, especially when it comes to indigenous viewpoints, is like it's all interconnected. Um, and so I think those recognitions of like gradients in um, like if you looked at the color wheel, that's gender. Um, and maybe even turning that into like a 3D ball, that's gender. <clears throat> and so I think that that recognition is also something to be integrated within the um, curriculum. And so that recognition and uh, equal footing of um, presentation of ideas, which would also integrate uh, the films that um, Tracy and I, and of course, Jen, I'm, I'm sure you have other films that you've worked on too. Um, I think that that's a, a necessary point because of the, the whitewashing of gender and of the women's movement in general. Um, and also the, the diver words the diversity in uh, the movement for feminism and for equity. Because um, like, yes, I may not look at, but also you have to consider like trans people's reproductive rights um, and how does that intersect with genocidal acts against, especially against native women in the seventies. And, you know, there are so many things to consider. So I, think it would impact the uh, curriculum all for the better to maybe even just start at say either my zine and then go from there. Um, but just recognizing how much bigger of a world there is beyond just the film. 
I agree. I was saying before, um, I wanted to say this before when we were talking about like where to start. Um, storytelling has so many formats. It doesn't have to be a film. They're, like podcasts are like the latest pandemic thing to do right now. Um, you know, you can write. There's so many different ways like art, zines. Um, there's so many different ways to get your stories out there. And um, I wanted to also share for um, I don't know if people are aware, but there's um, an organization called Vision Maker Media that actually funds a lot of Native American films, um, and they have a database. So I put in a link here. Um, those are funded films by Vision Maker. There's also a database of films um, from members of the Asian American Documentary Network, and I link that as well. And the Brown Girls Dog Mafia has their own database of members. You can search which member has what films out. Um, and I'm sure there's like plenty of other databases like this out for Manzanar are diverted right now, since we're doing the film festival circuit, we're not um, in, in the educational space yet, but we will be there. So if you want to specifically know about where, where we're going to be, um, you can follow us on our social media, manzanardiverted.com and um, join our listserv. And we're always like sending updates on like where we are in our film, you know, which film festival you can catch us next. We have three coming up in May. Uh, we're going to be the centerpiece film in Camfest, and we're also playing at Milwaukee Film Festival and Doxa for those Canadians. Um, and they're all geoblocked, so it does depend on like where you're living. But um, yeah, I, I think that just following filmmakers, their stories, and being in touch, um, you will be able to get them eventually to the classroom. And those databases, I think, are of um, documentaries that are currently available. And you know, Taro, um, Trace has been talking to me this about this for a while, but they're building a database. It's yet to launch, but you can already sign up and get uh, your initial information in there. Um, so kintheory.org. And Raven, you're on social media as well, right? Do you want to do a shout out to your um, Sure. Um, so on Instagram, I am at raven underscore two underscore feathers um also on twitter but i hardly ever use it uh raven the number two feathers jen do you ever use twitter because <laughs> i i just never got into it i only use twitter when i'm angry or looking for rapid news so <laughs> i'm also not Perfect. that on twitter <laughs> it's a good medium for writers um, though how you see them always posting stuff true um, and then also my uh, comic can be found, you can get a free PDF on qualificationsofbeing.com or you can buy a physical copy. But I knew when I was young, I was like, I'm making this for my younger self, I wouldn't buy it. I'd look at it and then maybe I'd donate later, years down the line, but yeah. Well, access is everything, right? So wanting to share your story, it makes it a lot easier if you are willing to have it online for free. <laughs> Totally. Um, well, we are so over time, but I don't want this to end. But unfortunately, out of respect for each other and the audience, I think we should. So I just cannot thank all of you. Tracy, you'll be watching this later, hopefully. Also, she was instrumental in putting this together. Her and I had this conversation about all these issues and, and, and possibilities. And this is what she came up with. And I just have to say, I think it was a perfect recipe. I am so inspired. You know, Raven, you talked about um, thanking and, and being um, touched. And I am so touched. I, I mean, I, I literally, I'm holding back tears because I'm so incredibly moved by the authenticity and the beauty in everything that's been shared tonight. And I just hope, uh, we've had over 50 um, viewers tonight and I hope that people will look back to this as a resource to find courage and to find um, joy and to be inspired to make a difference in the world because that's why we do this work. Um, Thank you, Sydney, also for awesome participation. It's incredible to, to have you involved and to have you be a part of this and the class that, that goes along with the series. So thanks, thanks to you. And we also have our wonderful partners in this program. Um, we had the Native American Cultural Programs here at UConn, Human Rights Institute, and um, Dodd Impact. And you know, I will say a real quick shout out. This year, we formed a human rights film and digital media initiative at the uh, through the Dodd and, and Human Rights. So we are gonna be working towards building some incredible um, networks. So you'll be hearing from me more about that and you can find that on the humanrights.ucon.edu 
website. Um, next week, we have another great event on Friday, April 2nd at 2 o'clock when we welcome UX designer Deneva Goines for inclusion in UI UX design. And we've got a couple more events on Friday. So subscribe to our YouTube channel so you can get those updates and follow us on social media at UConn DMD to see all of the great com um, content and also dmd.uconn.edu slash diverse. Uh, that has everyone's bios, links. What we'll actually do um, after this panel, we've got the chat. Uh, we're gonna put all those links that you talked about and put that back up on the webpage with your bios so that people have a, a central place where they can find um, all these great uh, resources. Um, and thanks everybody behind the scenes for, for running this and our, our whole team. Uh, and most of all, thanks to all the viewers out there. Like I said, we had over 50 people from around the country. That's really great for, thank you for spending your time with us on a Friday afternoon slash evening. Um, and I hope, again, I hope you're all so inspired. There's so much work to be done, but if we continue to have these conversations and bring people together, at least I can say I feel a lot more hopeful um, in our ability to, to make a difference uh, in the world. So thank you, stay safe, wear a mask, continue, it's spreading still, and have a wonderful weekend. Bye-bye. Thank you. Okay, it's done. I almost forgot I had to